see if we'll get the PowerPoint running. And it'll be there in a sec. But yes, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I have been here for almost 30 years. It'll be 30 years in two weeks. And of that, the last 20 years, I've been allowed to have the opportunity to really do a lot of wildlife research. So the last 20 years, almost all my research has been exclusively wildlife. Most of it with deer, but not always. We, we did some really neat snake projects the last two years, putting radio transmitters on snakes. And we worked with vultures and we worked with Quail, we did a lot of quail studies. We even had a quail racetrack, which was kind of fun. <laughs> Some quail liked it, and other ones would just jump out and walk away. So we had a lot of variety <laughs> with that. So it's really been a great place. It plays with raccoons, groundhogs. Meanest animal I've ever worked with is a groundhog. They look cute, but they were not our friends. <laughs> or we were not their friends, however you want to look at it. But what I wanted to do is, is spend some time talking about at least some of the aspects related to the deer. And I was trying to come up with a title in that sometimes we love them, sometimes we love them not. And I decided that was a little too heavy, so maybe just a little less. <laughs> um, but in that time, I've had great opportunities to see things like this, like cows checking out fawns and things like that. Several years ago, some of you have been around here long enough to remember, we had the six-legged deer thing. That, that was a whole experience. That was a new awakening in my life. Um, and I get to see some stuff a lot of people don't see, like a brand new style of deer trap. It's called a bicycle rack. Oh. So, and the deer was fine, and all of us got it turned loose without having to go to the hospital. Um, but, yes, the bike rack was okay too. <laughs> but it is an interesting arrangement. Um, so we've had a lot of things like that. McAllister Hall, we had a buck during the rut decide he was going to attack that one, and so we had deer run around on the first floor of the... McAllister Hall, and so there's a lot of excitement with it. So it's been a lot of fun, a lot of fun related to it. And really, the white-tailed deer really is a success story. If you look at it, what has happened is, you know, back in the 14, 1500s, there's estimated 45 million deer in the continental United States and Canada. And over time, because of unregulated hunting, it dropped. And as population grew and we hunted more and more, we got down to where 1,900, there's estimated less than 300,000 deer, white-tailed deer in the United States. And around 1,900 is when the Lacey Act and a few other things to start regulate hunting and start coming up with management aspects and management principles to help regulate wildlife populations. And so we're, we're up to around 30 million now. If you look at Georgia, the same actual thing happened is we got down to an estimated less than 5,000 deer in 1,900. Now think about that, Barron Stadium holds 6,500 people. So if you think about 5,000 deer in this whole state, there were almost no deer. And then over time, that number has gone up. We probably peaked around 2012, 2011, at about 1.4, 1.5 million, and now we're right about 1.2 million. And what's interesting with that, when we're talking about the concept of, of sanctuary at Berry College is that it, Berry College actually had a lot to do with the repopulation of deer in the state. There's a beautiful piece of work that Jerry Bearden, some of you may know, was a, a district wildlife biologist. He brought me this uh, a few weeks ago, actually. It went through a historical aspect of the restocking program in Georgia from the 1920s to the 1970s, where the Berry College area in northwest Georgia, a lot of deer were brought in, predominantly from Texas and some from Virginia and some other places, to try to start a new nucleus of deer. And the deer that survived there really became the Berry College deer, and the numbers started to grow. And then if you're familiar with this, it's a wonderful book, The Last Deer Trapper from Bill Collins. Um, and Bill still comes up occasionally. But it's a beautiful book about how Berry College was instrumentally involved as a nucleus for darting and capturing and transferring deer to other parts of the state. So Berry actually had a lot to do with helping to repopulate deer in the state as well. So they're really a neat species. So you go to Berry College, and one of the things that I always found interesting is, is when I first came here, people were talking about the deer to student ratio. <laughs> and the number is really interesting. When I first got here, it was two to one. And then I heard four to one and six to one. And I never hear an odd number, but it's gotten, <laughs> we don't have five to two or six to threes, or you know, if you're watching, watching the horse running the triple crown, we know. But at one point, it got up to 12 to one. And, and I start, you got to think about this for a minute, because at Berry College this past year, we have about 2,000 students. Now, I can tell you, think about 12 to 1 says that we'd have 24,000 deer. <laughs> this is not going to happen. <laughs> this picture 
there's about three to 4,000 wildebeest in this picture. Now, this is obviously in Africa. And there's a few zebra tusks in there, and there's a camper over here. I don't know why. <laughs> but there's about 4,000. So, again, the 12 to 1, don't, don't even think about it. We don't have 24,000 deer running around on campus. What we really have is about 1,500 deer, and the real ratio is 0.7 to 1. There's more students than there are deer. Now, that number will go up a little bit during fawning season because they'll have one to three offspring, but keep in mind that a vast majority of those fawns don't make it past six months. If they did, we would have 12 to 1 ratio, but they don't. They don't make it. So really, we're at like 0.7 to 1. So don't, don't worry about the 12 to 1. We're not being overrun yet, okay? Is that same return you had for the students? Yes. <laughs> of the students or the deer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. A couple other things that I've heard on occasion that they're genetically stunted and they're inbred and they're malnourished, and this just isn't true. They are a, a type of white-tailed deer that's adapted to our environment. A 100-pound, 150-pound deer here is about what the environment will hold. We don't have the perfect kind of soil like they do up in Wisconsin or up in Iowa where they have 200-pound deer. 200-pound deer would not survive here. It can't live off of clay and acidic soil, which is really what we have. So they're, they are what they are, just like the Florida Keys deer is actually a subspecies of whitetail. You know, an 80-pound Florida Keys deer is a big one, but it's adapted to fit into that kind of environment. So really, we don't see any of these kind of problems, but I will tell you a study that we're just starting now, and we started this fall, is we're actually trying to do the, the 23andMe and Ancestry.com thing with deer. So I'm working with a geneticist, Sunday Peters, because he loves to do the lab work, which is great, because I'd rather do the outside work, and I'm glad we have people who like to do that. And he's very good at it. But what we're doing, basically, is coming up with some genetic markers, and we're going to quantitate what a buried deer is. Then we're going to start taking samples of deer from different parts of the state and around the country and kind of build a profile of how these deer move and change and what they actually are. So that's something we just started this fall. So that's, that's one of our newer studies where we are going to look at the genetic stuff. But again, they're not stunted. They're not malnourished. Are there years where it's a little rough? Yes. But right now is not one of them. It's a happy deer year. They all look very round, and they're not diametrically challenged, but they're not skinny either. Okay, So they're, they're very good related to that. So we got a lot of stuff with deer. One of the things that a lot of people like to, to, to visit about or at least understand is just the basic life cycle of deer and what's happening over the years. So we have months going across here, and probably the biggest areas during the breeding season, which we really talk about the rut and the estrus cycle, and then fawning season. And of course, we've named deer, at least, or white-tailed deer and some of the other deer as being bucks being males and does females and fawn being the offspring, okay? So if we, if we work through this, we can start with the bucks because actually they're kind of boring. What they're doing is a little bit boring. So what are they doing right now? Nothing. <laughs> they're just kind of hanging around, White-tailed deer don't really have tight family groups like some other types of deer, like black-tailed deer and mule deer actually have family groups. They're kind of loose family groups. But during this time of the year, you'll have what are called bachelor groups. You'll see groups of two to four, mostly bucks wandering around. Um, remember that the antlers are antlers. They are not horns because antlers fall off. They're made out of bone. During this time of year, there's a lot of blood flow going up there, a lot of nutrients to help calcify these structures. Okay, so that's what's happening within. They're just running around kind of growing antlers and being in their bachelor's group. So that's going to happen up until the fall when this breeding season starts. Once we get into this breeding season area that we call the rut, there's a lot of physical changes and behavioral changes that go on with the deer. It's mostly due to this gigantic peak in one hormone, testosterone. Dramatically changes them. So physically, one of the char characteristics you'll see is that thickening of the neck the anabolic kind of steroid effects of a lot of testosterone. Um, Behavior-wise, they will start changing. Instead of being in these nice, polite bachelor groups, they get into little spitting matches of who's bigger than who and who's stronger than who. And the objective's not to kill the other one. It's to kind of control a territory so that they have a better opportunity to reproduce. Peak rut in our area is somewhere between November 3rd and November 11th. It does change a little bit, but it's somewhere in there is the absolute peak. That's when they're the most active trying to seek out females that are ready to be bred, which is also, we might talk about it later, coincides with the highest proportion of deer vehicle collisions because the deer are most active then and less aware of what's happening in the rest of the world. So that's what's happening there. And after this breeding season, we get down into the January to April, May. The testosterone level comes down. They start to become more docile in their bachelor group behaviors. 
The antlers will fall off. I find lots of antlers usually in tractor tires, which is not my favorite way of finding them, <laughs> antler sheds. Um, but they will shed those antlers, and that's kind of where we're at now. And then they will kind of start this whole cycle back over and go back into these bachelor groups. So there's a, is a pretty easy kind of cycle. The does are a little bit different. We're, we're going to start with after fawning, because we're right in the middle of fawning season right now. But after the fawns are born, what are they doing? Well, they're really raising the fawns. A white-tailed deer will have anywhere from one to three offspring. Again, a vast majority of them will not survive. Again, if they did, we'd be really overrun. But a vast majority of them will not survive. After about three to four months, they will start to lose their spots and typically be weaned or the female will separate them sometime when you're looking at September, October, something like that. So that's what's happening there. The reproductive cycle for them is kind of occurring during this time period too. We call deer basically a seasonal breeding animal. A cow will breed year round. They'll have normal reproductive cycles year round. Deer do not. Sheep don't, most breeds of goat don't. We call them short day seasonal breeders in that they have normal reproductive cycles. And short day, if you think about it, is time period, light relative to dark. So starting in the fall, is when they start to have their normal reproductive cycles. Okay, that's what a short day breeder is. And this also obviously coincides with the male having maximum drive for reproduction, and so that's when breeding is going to occur. They're, each one of their little, their cycles are about 20 days long, and on the average you're looking at something like 70% conception rate to a cycle. 70% chance of getting pregnant to that cycle. So it's really kind of a law of diminishing returns you got 70%, then the 30% that are left, 70% of those will get bred to the next one, to the next cycle. So they're a relatively tight group as far as finding. So that's what's going on there. What's happening during this time is gestation, and gestation or pregnancy is about 200 days. This was a very polite group of deer. This, my parking spot for my office is right here. <laughs> so I drove up, and there's 20 deer standing there looking at me. This is about 30 days ago. And if you look, if you look, you can kind of see distension. So pregnant, 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 ready to explode, ready to explode, ready to explode. <laughs> so this is about 30 days ago, and of course it was very polite of them to do that for us. Um, but they going to be fairly tight, 30 to 45, 50 day window, you're gonna have all these offspring born. So that's what's happening during gestation. Then when we get to finding season, they're going to go ahead and, and go through the birth process, the partuition process, typically produce one to three offspring is not uncommon for white-tailed deer, and they're pretty small. Five to eight pounds is a typical size, so they're little if you really look at them. They're very, very small for their size. So, so that's what's happening with that part. So you end up with something like this. So here's, here's a fawn, newborn fawn. It's still damp, and this one I almost fell over, and so fortunately I had a camera, which is handy, but I almost fell over. This one is still kind of damp, and that's kind of cool. It's kind of neat. So fawning season is really the neatest season at Barry and one of the worst seasons at Barry. And, and the, we have these things of good deed doers. Now what does a good deed doer do? They do good stuff. Does that make sense? I mean, as an example, a good deed doer, when you see a tortoise walking across the road, what do you do? Most of us, if the traffic's okay, we try to pull over and we try to scooch it over. And some, I do it with snakes and anything else that I can. I like, I like to help them. That's a good deed doer, right? Problem is sometimes good deed doers are trying to do the right thing, but are actually creating more problems. For example, these two things are not the same beasts. What is this? It's a turtle. Turtles live in the water. This is a tortoise. Where do they live? On land. Well, there's some big problems in Florida right now. Do-gooders. But these do-gooders are really creating the disasters because what they're doing is they're walking along finding tortoises and saving them by putting them in the ocean. That is a do-gooder disaster. And they're trying to figure out how to, please don't help. Leave the tortoises alone. They don't <laughs> swim very well. That's when we run into problems. Well, we have this problem with deer too. We have do-gooder disasters and I call it the abandoned fawn syndrome. If there's a fawn on the ground and mama isn't within four feet, it needs rescued. It must be safe. And they really don't. Deer are kind of unique with that. 
Part of the problem is, and we'll talk about this, they habituate to people really well too. So they can be outside your window, they can be outside a pool, they can be dang near in the pool. Mama may put them wherever. This one's out smoking cigarettes hiding somewhere. No. <laughs> but that doe will put fawns down and leave them there for up to eight hours. Sometimes they'll sneak in a nurse and go away and leave them longer than that. And they're perfectly fine. So our biggest problem with this thing is we really got to quit doing this. And we really work hard at Barry to say, look, they don't need help. They really don't need help. We need to leave them alone. We don't need to try to steal their offspring. And when I tell people stealing offspring, then they feel a little, they'll back off a little bit. But they really are doing just fine. Bless you. If it's hot, they'll move. If mama wants them somewhere else, she'll put them somewhere else. They, they're very, very good at that. There are some animals who actually try to steal offspring besides people. I was out one time, this was a couple years ago, and I see this doe running around in circles outside with this dairy cow. And I'm thinking, something's going out there. So I go out there, and this dairy cow stole her baby. So I stole it back. <laughs> I took the dairy cow away, and she was not happy. Mama ended up being happy. I've also known an occasional horse will do that. That's, we, we, we always call them baby-stealing mares, but sometimes you have a mare that try to steal other foals. Sometimes they'll try to steal babies, too. But as a general rule, they don't. So the big problem we have is us. So if we can just leave them alone and not be a do-good or disaster, life would be a whole lot better. Plus, what I think is important for people to know is a couple things. It's illegal to maintain a deer or to try to rehab it for a couple reasons. Even a facility that has a rehab license cannot rehabilitate a deer in this state. And the reason is, is deer imprint on you way too easy. Once that deer is imprinted on a person, it can't go back in the wild and survive. It will hang around people or it'll get to where when it's during the breeding season, when you watch those video clips and it shows a deer attacking somebody, 99% of the times that was a hand raised deer that now you're a challenge. They're not afraid of you anymore. That's where our problem is. So you're not even allowed to rehab them. So if we can keep people just to leave them alone, life is good. And they're supposed to be. This is part of the cycle of life and all that. There's a lot of things that like to eat fawns, even our eagles. I saw the eagles take one once. It was pretty cool, but I didn't have a camera. Well, I thought it was cool. <laughs> Again, circle of life, Lion King, right? It's okay. Okay, so that's, that's really what's happening. So if we can leave the fawns alone, the does do fine. Okay, they do fine raising the babies. So, so really, if we think about them, why do we love white tiller? They're very charismatic species, they're a beautiful species, but they're also important a lot of other aspects from the social fabric, from hunting. I love venison. It's a wonderful thing. And it, if you read in a paper yesterday, it was actually in there with our commissioner of the DNR, that's showing that hunting and fishing is a $3.6 billion influx into, the, into Georgia's economy alone. So it's extremely important. And it helps to manage some populations in some cases. So in both cases, th they're wonderful things to have around, okay? So I think, now there's sometimes we love them a little less. What are the two major things where we love them less? Cars. Deer vehicle collisions and eating stuff, right? Is there an answer to both of these? Yes, I do have the solution. It's called don't drive and don't plant. <laughs> and it'll work. <laughs> Very effective. Otherwise, it's a big challenge. And a lot of times people will come up to me and say, will this work? And I'll go, maybe, no, yes, it depends. And people get angry because we want a yes, no, but it isn't a yes, no. And a lot of people say, well, do I have to think like a deer? And I go, no, you don't have to think like a deer. What you need to do is think like a person first. You know, would this scare you and why? <laughs> and then second, understand that how a deer perceives the world is going to influence it because they use their senses like we do, but they use them different because their senses are a little bit different. So if you think like a person and then we're going to work through how a deer perceives the world, you can actually look at this stuff because everything they do is based off of this same concept of motivation relative to risk. We do it all the time. When we do it, when we're looking at, at scenarios to buy a car or to buy a stock or are we going to buy this over this or this grill over this grill, we're looking at at cost versus benefit, motivation relative to risk. Simple example, you're walking down Broad Street. You're on the sidewalk, you see a dollar there. You have a little motivation to pick it up. What's the risk if you're on the sidewalk? Not much. What if it's in the middle of the road? <laughs> Your motivation may be here, but the risk went up to here, so you don't do it. What if it's a $100 bill in the road? 
Well, motivation might have gone up even with the risk, but now you're more motivated until it's that night and it's at the corner of Turner, McCall, and Hicks. Oh, I'm not going there for nobody or a $100 bill. <laughs> but those changes make a big difference. Can be other things too, like would you take money away from this dog guarding your money? Sure, probably not a big deal. Motivation be here, risk could be low. What if it's a Debesian Mastiff? <laughs> risk factor went up. So if you think about motivation relative to risk and understand what they do, you can help figure out how to find more deer, to attract deer, if you want to hunt, if you want to bring them in, if you don't want to bring them in. And keep in mind, it's always fluid. What works here may or may not work here because of these factors. And these factors will keep changing them all the time. So what a deer is doing, the same thing we do. We use our senses. We use touch, taste, smell, hearing, and vision. We use all of these things for motivation relative to risk. And we do it too. So if you look at how a deer works and how it functions, one aspect, if you look at tactile, which really means touch, um, if you've ever taken a look at a deer's foot or played with them, you'll see that they're really not designed for superb traction on anything slippery. It's great if they're on something hard and rocky, so they can handle rock, or something that's a little bit softer, they can move pretty well. But anything that has stuff like snow and ice, they're not very good. Bambi wasn't very good on it either. But even crossing a road, if that road has a high silica base, they don't watch it. You can see it, because the deer will go run up the road and then go same thing that we do when we're stepping on something slippery. So tactile, they're really kind of weak from that standpoint. Taste buds, I've never seen a good taste bud study done on deer. It'd be very expensive to do. But if you look at a couple species, you'll notice this. Cows got a lot, rabbit has a lot, humans have less, dogs have less, cats have even less. What do these animals generally eat? What kind of animals are these? They're herbivores. Mm -hmm. Yes, kitties have no taste. <laughs> so they're herbivores, right? They have to get all their nutrients from plants. So being able to really select out the nutrient value of these plants becomes really important. Omnivores like us, we're kind of in the middle of the road. We get stuff from meat, which has a complete protein, pretty good balance of stuff. But we also do some higher concentrate plants. Dogs actually kind of in between a true carnivore and a person, which is kind of true, because what will your dog eat, dang near anything you give them? Go give your cat a piece of cantaloupe and watch. I mean, they just. <laughs> but that true carnivore eating just meat doesn't need a lot of taste buds because that meat has everything that it needs, so it just doesn't worry about it. So we really expect that that deer is very similar to some of these other herbivores, probably has pretty well-developed <coughs> taste buds. Digestive system, there's a couple different kinds that are, that are out. Ours is very similar to what you see with this carnivore where we have an esophagus. And then we have a single chambered stomach, relatively short, small, and large intestines. And that's typical of a carnivore and omnivore, a few differences of that. A deer happens to be a ruminant. And basically, a ruminant has a four-chambered stomach um, and a much longer GI tract. So this is one that act actually is out of a sheep. And if this were set up appropriately, this largest chamber is the rumen. It'd be on the left side. And these two would flip over this side to the right side. Um, so what is this thing for is really that deer or that sheep or goat is no more able to digest grasses than we are. What it does is creates a symbiotic relationship. This chamber fills up with microbes, bacteria, yeast, fungi, protozoan that can break down those grasses and get nutrients out of it. But it's no more able to eat, go out and graze on your Bermuda or fescue lawn than we are. But this makes it really a key. And then the other thing that's really cool, or I think it's cool, some kids don't like it, but I think it's really nifty, is we chew up stuff, we masticate it to break it down, and then we swallow it. When it comes back up, we're usually not happy. If it comes up this way. Because <laughs> that's massive convulsions of the stomach, and you've got all these gastric secretions, and it just burns, and this doesn't taste very pleasant. A ruminant, like a deer and a sheep and a cow, can actually swallow both ways. So they can chew stuff, swallow it down, go somewhere where it's safe, and you heard the term chewing the cud or ruminating, they will go somewhere in the safe and swallow it back up and remasticate it to help with digestion. And I thought, man, that'd be so cool. Think about having the best hot fudge sundae, <laughs> and you go eat it, and an hour later you go, let's do it again. And you can bring <laughs> it back up. And not have to pay for it. And not have to pay again. <laughs> and it says, so you look at all the benefits. See, it'd be a wonderful deal. So yeah, they are dramatically different with that. 
Um, and that's because there's the chemical part of their stomach, and they do have one. Actually, it's this one called the ibomasum. That is like our stomach, but that's way down the line. Up in here, no, there's no acid and stuff. It's just perfect. So yeah, they can go back and forth with it, which is really kind of nifty. And it helps the deer a lot with that too. So basically, a deer is a ruminant, which is one type of forage-eating organism that has these microbes. They eat about five to eight pounds a day. And there's really two different kind of grazing or eating behaviors. Animals that are like this are either browsing animals or grazing animals. And a perfect example is if you look at goats and sheep. Sheep are grazing animals. They prefer grass first, and then will eat other forbs and leaves and things second. So if you get, like I was just in the Sonoma Valley a couple weeks ago, and you'll see, you'll see sheep all over the orchards and the vineyards like these. These are great. Because the sheep will go in there, and as long as there's grass, they're going to eat the grass first. Now, they get hungry enough, they will eat the grapes. Now, what would happen if I put my goats in there? Your grapes are gone, and then when they're starving, they'll eat the grass. That's the big difference. So a, a goat is a browsing animal. They prefer the leaves, the flowers, the edges, those kinds of things. And then we'll eat grass when they have to. Whereas a grazing animal prefers to have the grass first, and then we'll eat other stuff. Well, deer are obviously a browsing animal, true. Your garden should tell you that and your flowers and a few other things. So they eat a wider variety of plant material, actually a little bit higher nutrition than what grasses are. A little less fiber, more nutrients. So they like things like acorns and fruit and things like that, that a lot of grazing animals won't. Okay, so that's what's kind of happening on that end. This is always one of the funnest ones, is the ability to smell. And we assume that these things are astronomically out of the world and can smell everything from 42 miles away and do everything perfect. And you know what? There's no really good study. So I did what everybody does, go to the internet. Because the internet, it's got to be right, right? <laughs> and so I found on the internet this, that a deer has 20 times the smell capability that humans do. And then I found one that says that it's 100 times. And then this one says that it's 500 to 1,000 times better than a person. Finally found one that came up with a number, but then I'll tell you about it. So this one said white-tailed deer have up to 297 million olfactory receptors. That's the specialized nerves in the sinuses. Dogs have 220 million, humans have five. It's not really correct, but we'll talk about that in a second. Actually, this number was made up. Because, and, and 297, who would come up with a perfect number like that? But the guy was just guessing. And, and it popped in there. Dogs actually have somewhere between 220 million to a billion receptors. And humans are around five to seven million. That has been documented, dogs and humans. But this one says a typical white-tailed deer has five times more than a bloodhound, which means if a bloodhound has close to a billion, this deer has these receptors growing somewhere. If it has five <laughs> times more than, they're coming out of somewhere. And this was my very favorite one. This is when they, they made the assumption that dogs can detect odors 40 feet underground, so a deer can do it even deeper. Why would a deer even care what's 40 <laughs> feet underground? <laughs> Interesting stuff. But what it really amounts to, we don't have a clue. <laughs> is there is nothing to suggest that there's any major studies out there. Now, if you were to look at, and I've got like a deer skull and a coyote skull, if you look where the, there's turbinate bones, and these are the locations that, on the inside is where these specialized nerves reside. And if you look at a surface area standpoint, I would bet that in this coyote skull, there's a lot more surface area for receptors than there is in this deer. Plus, if you think about it, what does the deer need smell receptors for? What does a coyote need it for? Or the dog? They rely on scent to find their food. We don't really have to have a lot of scent capability. So they're probably pretty good, but I don't think they've got five times more than a bloodhound. But who knows? Who knows? But I don't know if I necessarily believe it, even though it was on the internet. Okay, so they're, they're probably pretty good at it. We don't know. Hearing. Hearing's a little bit hard. Most of us have done a hearing test, and you go and you put a little headphones on, they go, raise your hands when you hear it. It's hard to do with a deer. So <laughs> raise your little toes. So... What we did, and there's a couple ways to do it, but one of the things that we did, and this is a joint project with the University of Georgia for hearing, is we did an auditory brainstem response. Because you have specialized hairs inside of your ear that are nerves. 
And if they are stimulated, they send that information to the brain, scrambles around, says you hear something. So what we did is intercepted the electrical signals. So we assumed that if the electrical signals go into the brain, then they could possibly hear it. That's what auditory brain stem is. And what we found basically is a human, I kind of put a, I put a piano down here because the keys kind of match the frequency. So if you think about a, a 72 key piano, you're looking at something like that is a deer and a human basically have similar ranges, although a deer can hear up into the 20 hertz range. That's the ultrasound of the high frequency ranges. So to get to 20 hertz, you have to add about 25 more keys onto your piano on the high end, that'd be up at 20 hertz. So they can hear that, but not dramatically better than ours. So they can hear a little bit higher than we do. Vision, vision's a little bit different as well. If you look at the, the cross-section of an eye, what happens is light comes in, pupil kind of focuses it. There's a lens here, and the lens's job is to bend the light onto the back of your eye where the retina is, and that's where you have specialized nerves that stimulate light, goes to your brain, scrambles around, and say you see things, okay? So that's similar with us. Now what we have is something really cool is that at distance, our lens actually gets flatter to focus on the back, and then close up, it actually gets rounder. So it changes shape in order for us to see far away and close up. Most animals don't have that. Most animals have a lens that is fixed. It has very little ability to change. Think about an old box camera or your old Kodak cameras where you didn't have the ability to focus. They're kind of fixed. Most animals are fixed. Deer are pretty much fixed. Their lens has very limited ability to change, and it's kind of fixed to where they see better farther away. It's different than nearsighted and farsighted in people. Nearsighted and farsighted in people is the shape of your eyeball. If you have a real short, squatty eyeball, you're farsighted, and if it's long, you're nearsighted. That's the shape of our eye. There, their lens is kind of fixed. They can see a little better far away. Than what? Why might that be useful? See better farther away. Predators. predators one. And what do they do if a predator is after them? Run. They run. Might it be useful to be able to see clearly 50 yards ahead of you when you're running 40 miles an hour? Yeah, because by the time you're there, where are you? It's on top of it. So yeah, so both of those probably relate to why it's more beneficial seeing farther away. They also have a tape in them. So we talked about the deer in the headlight look. So this was a flash photograph I took that was actually not at Barry. There are other deer that you can get close to. So this wasn't at Barry, but that's a tape in them. And the tape in them is on the back of some species eye. There's a layer of reflective tissue. And so what happens is if under low light conditions, a photon of light comes in, stimulates a nerve for you to see, but then it hits this reflective layer, comes back, and hits another one. So it's kind of like light amplification. So animals that have this can see better under low light. And then a deer obviously has, and it's even more fun at night. So that's a picture of deer. It looks like 60 watt light bulbs, but it's just a reflection of the light coming back in, and it can be in different shapes and sizes. Which is why in the old days with old cameras, you used to have this concept, red eye, because we don't have a tape of them. What do we have inside there? It tends to be red. It's called blood. So you're actually looking at the capillaries in the back of your eye. That's what red eye was really from. And then cats obviously have a pretty well-developed tape of them too. So they can see better under low light conditions. Color vision is also based off of specialized nerves. In humans, we really have three primary types of nerves. We have blue, green, and red. And proportions of those nerves being stimulated goes to our brain, gets scrambled around, and helps us figure out what color it is. So we have a particular rainbow. Most animals also see in color, but they see it differently. So for example, in humans, our rainbow looks like this. Deer in most species are not trichromic. They don't have three colors. They see in two primary colors. And so a deer's rainbow looks like that. Okay, so what do you see different? There's three big ones. Yeah, red kind of fades out to more yellows and earth tones. The grass is not greener on the other side because it's yellow. And what else? Yeah. <laughs> or it will be in another month, right? Yeah, they can see a whole lot more into the UV lower light ranges. Part of that's because of the, the way their cone operates. And they also don't have a UV filter. We actually have a built-in ultraviolet filter to help take some of that out. So they can actually see down in this range, which all of this really helps under low light vision. So they do see in color, it's just a little different. So we might see a picture like this is what this would look like to us. And if you were a deer or a horse or a dog or a cat, they're all very similar. It looked more like that. So it's more blues and earth tones is what it really amounts to. So it's very, very common with that. Okay, so 
That's a big aspect of how they see things. And then there's two big behavior ones we've got to talk about before we hit any research. And one of them is, is first, so what is a deer if we put this together? So vision-wise, we call them crepusecular, which means they're best adapted to see under low light conditions, kind of dusk and dawn. They're not really super good at nocturnal, but pretty good under low light. Um, their lens is fixed to see farther away, and their rainbow is just a little different. So they do see in color. We talked about taste, probably pretty well developed. They are ruminants. Pretty much eat things similar to what a goat would, more than a sheep. Hearing, a little more range than people. Smell, who knows, but probably pretty good. And then touch, they're really not designed well for slippery surfaces. Okay? Behavior-wise, there's a couple things to look at, too. First, where do deer live? They don't live in the woods. They live on the edge of woods. They're an edge species. Most of the nutrients they want to eat are on the edges. The forest is a great place for cover. It's a good place to hide. It's a good place to transit between places, but not to live there. And this will give you an example. So this is at Berry College. So here's Highway 27. Here's the entrance. There's the, the roundabout. Herman Hall's there. Here's the Ford building. And this red marks off where we put a radio collar on a deer, and it spends 95% of its time in this area, not in the woods. And if you see what happens when you got a bunch of deer, it looks like this. So here's Highway 27, here's the roundabout, and here's the log cabins in Ford. Each one of these different colors is a different deer. And if you look where the woods are out here, where are the deer? They're on the edge of the woods. Except for this one, it's running back and forth across the highway. No. We try. We try. So. Yeah, they don't go very far. We actually, we can talk about that some too. The home range on our deer is not very big. Little compared to lots of places. Which, if you think about it, kind of makes sense. Because if you got everything, why go to Bolivia? You really don't have to. And if you're safe here, why go over there? Exactly. Yeah, so they're, they're pretty smart. So one aspect is an edge species. The other is this. They're one of the few species that readily habituates to humans. Most species don't. There's a couple that do, but think about how many of you have seen bobcats? And you got to work to find them. But they're everywhere on campus. we got a lot of bobcats. You don't see them because they don't want to be around you. Other ones kind of habituate a little bit better. Coyotes. <laughs> One what? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would wake you right up. That would be a little spooky. But that's why we have this kind of concept where we can see, and they will habituate to people depending on the condition. This is one of the reasons why people think we have 12 billion deer at Berry, Berry College, <laughs> is you can see them, but you also, people make the assumption they're spread out equally over all 27,000 acres, and they're not. They're all around these edges, and this is a great kind of protection area, because people aren't really a threat under this condition. They're not being hunted, they're not being forced, they're not being under pressure, and they're smart enough to figure that out, that I don't need to be scared here. And we all do that too. There's parts of go down to Atlanta I'm comfortable in, there's parts I'm less comfortable in. It varies, it changes. So they figure that out to a big, big degree. And to show you what we did, is, so this is outside my office, I'm over in Westcott, and there's a little bowl there, and I had some extra corn in my uh, our office manager, Becky McLarty, helped me with this little deal. I said, let's see what happens if I go out and throw out one scoop of corn over a nine-day period. And on day nine, this is what happens. So I walk out there, have my little scoop, and there's two deer waiting for me. <laughs> I start to sling this stuff out, and then there's three deer, and then there's five deer, and then there's seven deer, and then there's 14 deer, and then there were 21 deer after nine days of doing this. And I even got photobombed. So with no hunting pressure, they figure out the food deal, they're happy, boom, they're there. That's an animal habituating to people. That is not very common. Again, very few species do that. I read a study last night that was really kind of cool showing that, that 62 different species that do kind of habituate around people become more nocturnal versus those not around people. And included deer and coyotes and raccoon and the ones we think about coming in, they learn to work around us and still be able to live in our environment. It's really kind of a neat deal, but that came out like yesterday. Okay, so let's go back to this. So now we've talked about the pieces and parts, and we're gonna talk about some of this research stuff. And then I want you to think about what happens and why. So if, if we start with the deer vehicle collisions, for example, and we follow this thing of talking like a person and, and working through this, 
realized, for example, Georgia, one of the top 10 states in the country for documented deer vehicle collisions because we have a lot of white-tailed deer. And some of these are not too hard to figure out. I took this picture actually last week. This is again outside my office, bright and early in the morning. And you look and what do you see? You see 20 deer along the road. They're not waiting for cars. <laughs> Why are they there? Yeah, it's not that uncommon. So we have a hay field here, and in that hay field, what's in there? Grass, that's not their preferred deal. They like up here where we have clover and things, so we have a lot of deer there. And that's okay for us. State used to do that a lot. And we recommended the state that, you know, perhaps planting red clover all along the highway is not in our best interest. So they finally stopped doing that. But if you're creating a situation to bring the animals in, so that's an easy one. Not create the resource to where their motivations to come up here and then the chances of deer vehicle collision go up. So that's a very simple one. Fencing is kind of cool too. Oh, this one is kind of interesting too, deer whistles. There's a lot of stuff with deer whistles. You put them on there, it's supposed to make ultrasound sound and it's supposed to scare them away. Okay, so we decided we were gonna do a study with this thing and it was kind of hard to do because the first thing you had to do is first you gotta figure out do they hear it? We yes, we know they can hear it. But then we had to come up with a better way of controlling it. So this was a joint project with the University of Georgia. We built a sound we could control it any pitch we wanted at any volume, and we put on some jamming speakers. <laughs> two in the front going forward, two at the side, and we were blasting it at 115 to 120 decibels, close to a shotgun blast going off, and we got up into the 20 and 30,000 hertz. And what would you expect to happen? So ask yourself first, if you hear a whine, does it scare you? Yeah. No. So why would a deer be scared? Guess what? They aren't. <laughs> in fact, and I tried to find a clip because we had videotaped so you'd see deer and you'd be out there and I'd go, okay, I get to drive. And it's really fun. You gotta go down that same road. I just showed you the pictures and we videotaped what the deer did and analyze their behavior. And there's a couple times where they're eating and then the car come by and they're up and they just watch you go by and you can see their little brain going, hey dude, something's wrong with your car. It's gonna <laughs> they don't work. Plus there's some physics problems too with the sound travel is that high pitch does not travel that far and think, okay, it's gotta be far enough to where they can hear it, then they have to associate that with something wrong and then have to make a decision which way to go and by then you've run over them four times. So it's not very simple. But those basically we found did not work very well, but that was pretty fun with that. Fences, fencing is, is one of the best ways to keep deer out and basically an eight foot fence will keep 90% of deer out. They can jump that. One of the challenges with it, there's a couple fold. A, they're very expensive. They're hard to maintain. There's also one factor that scares me a little bit is if you go down some of the corridors where they have these, it also keeps 80% of the deer in. That if they get in through gates and things, you may have a problem. So we wanted to see if we could come up with something different. So this was actually at Berry College along the Viking Trail. We tested, we put up, we put radio collars on deer and let them run around for a while and we put up a mile of eight foot fence, then we came up with another fence, a four foot fence that had a two foot outrigger, and then the material that's on here is actually a quarter inch monofilament line. It's like a giant fishing line. And when we put this up, what we found is it was about 90% effective at keeping deer away, but we found something else cool. Because think about this, can a deer jump fish? Yes. If they were to jump it, what sense are they using? Vision, does that make sense? And this creates a little psychological barrier because guess which way they're happily willing to jump? Mm -hmm. This way, but not back. And we saw that a lot. And we saw the ground on this side would be absolutely torn up because they didn't want to jump this way versus this way because their vision and the depth perception and where the top is just didn't work in their brain. So they go, no, the motivation worth the risk is not there. So this was kind of cool, but that's why that worked. Okay, so it's very kind of logical with that. We also want to fool once with the biggest weakness in a fence is usually gates. Mm -hmm. And so we want to say, okay, could we take advantage of something else? So we set up these plots to where we had deer coming in and had this wide open, and then we made a slippery gate. Mm -hmm. We made panels and we put them at a little bit of an angle there and you could walk over them just fine. Guess what happened when deer stepped on them? Yep. They really were not pleased. And actually, you could hear a deer fall from like a quarter mile away. You'd hear, <laughs> and motivation relative risk wasn't there. So we just wanted to test the concept, and that's working with tactile. So again, motivation relative to risk was a big deal with that. 
Repellent. There's really a couple different kinds of repellents. Um, big factor is what senses are we working for with repellents? If we're doing blood meal or the stinky rotted egg stuff. Mostly olfactory smell and maybe some taste. And a thought process, one of the thought process is that this stuff, when it decomposes, releases sulfur, which is why it's stinky, which is also predator poop. Smells that way too. So you put it out and it's supposed to do this, this, and this. What's your experience with any repellent? Or it works not very long. Yeah, till it rains or something changes. Mm -hmm. Or again, what happens if you think about it, so we've tested a lot of them, is if the motivation is here, when you first put the stuff out, it's new, it's kind of scary. So risk went up to here, so they go away. Then what happens? <laughs> Nothing happens. And so the risk goes down and motivation's there, boom, they're there. That's why it'll work sometimes here for a while and sometimes not elsewhere. Or if you do something like hair, if they're in an area where they're hunted hard and associate humans with something negative is different than if they're in an area where they're always around people and they're not a threat. So again, thinking through that becomes important. Sound can be like that too. We set up some ones with sound that were really kind of fun, motion activated deals. And one of them played, they would walk into this field of view and the sound would pop up and it would be coyotes, pups with a rabbit squeal. <laughs> so what does that mimic? What would it make? them initially perceive that there's a coyote den there, nabbed a rabbit, this is not a good place to be. So the numbers were up here, deer numbers are up here. We turn the machine on, what happens? Number of deer plummeted, and after three days, guess what happened? They go, there's no coyote here, and there's still food here. Boom, came back up. Did it with pigs too, Avelina's a little pig. Uh, most animals are petrified of pigs, and there's a good reason. So we did the same thing. Numbers up here, psh, go down and come back up. Then just for fun, and I don't know why I did this, but I did it. Played an Eddie Van Halen, 50 <laughs> and 50 album. Jamming, if you're not familiar with Eddie Van Halen. Serious rock band. We played Eddie Van Halen, what happened? Jing there. <laughs> it was close, nothing happened. The numbers were here, cranked up Eddie Van Halen, and go, cool, dinner's still here. <laughs> why on a college campus was that true? because they hear music all the time, so there was no threat to start with. But it was awesome. They just <laughs> flatlined. <laughs> yeah, it's even better. We tried a couple other ones too. Is what if you look at a real natural threat? Um, if you've heard a, a deer blow or a deer alert, it's really kind of interesting thing. I'll play it for you. And what we did basically, let's see if she talks to us. Come on, you can do it. Oh, please. Well, maybe we won't. But if you've heard a deer blow before, basically what happens is it's an alert call, and it's a, it's a real phoom, phoom kind of a sound, which sounds better than what I did. So what I did is I re recorded it, and then I built this, this contraption to where I could turn it on or off from up to a quarter mile away. And we wanted to do a study, what would a deer do naturally? So we really had two different setups, and I hope this thing will play, because it's really kind of fun. So what we did is, what would happen if a deer hears this alert in the daytime versus what happens at night? And actually, you can see right there, do you see that little piece of white? That's the speaker sitting there. Mm -hmm. Let's see if it does it. You can't hear it, but you'll be able to know. Boom! Whoa, wow. So the sound just went off, but then watch what happens. They're going, hey, wait a minute. Let's go see who that was. <laughs> and they actually start walking back toward it. So it's an alert, but it's like, hey, let's go see what's happening there. Okay, so that's what happens during the daytime. What happens at night? Deer sitting there. This is on a thermal camera, and you won't have a hard time figuring out when it goes off. They're going, wait, and they got up and they said, we're leaving, you're on your own. Can't look at it, so the risk factor is too high, and they go, no, we're not going to play this game. This doesn't work. So even in the, in the day and night time, so really, if you stop and think about it, this is your whole key, is if you want to attract deer or get rid of deer, think about, as a person, would it scare you and why and under what conditions, and then what can you do relative to what the deer sees and hears to make those things work. So couple different take-home messages. 
um, fond, let's just leave them alone. They're doing fine. Life is good. Um, don't need to rehab them. Can't rehab them. That's just a, a rough thing for a deer if we play with them. You want to think with these things. Think like a person, but then recognize and keep in mind that they see things differently, hear it a little bit differently. And then you can adjust your protocol depending on what your objective is. And then the last thing I think is, I mean, they're really kind of a cool species, so maybe if we should just love them instead. <laughs> Take them like an extended family that they're not all perfect, but life is good. Okay? Very good. With that, I'll be, I'll be glad to answer any questions or talk about whatever y'all would like. They will keep moving them around and actually try to make them nurse and stuff. Oh. And it won't work very well. There's some anatomical challenges besides altitude and volume. But they will do that. Now, horses will on occasion, at least with other fawns, I mean, they will try to raise them themselves. Yeah. Very rare, but it, and it's usually consistent. If you have one, it is one. You know, if it's a, if it's a mama, whatever, they will try to snitch them. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Couple questions. Sure. So if the antlers fall off every year, and then you see these bucks and these huge, you know, like you know, ten point bucks. Yes. That's no indication of his age because his antlers never fall off. Is it his DNA? Now, why are some of them bigger than others? It's a lot of it is it's age and nutrition. So as they as they mature, a couple things are going to happen is this testosterone peak will, will be more and higher. And it's really anabolic. When we talk about anabolic steroids, all it really means is it's increasing metabolic rate and shunting nutrients to whatever the genetics say to do is all it really does. Um, so the net effect is as they reach maturity, they're getting more testosterone sooner that's helping to shunt nutrients more. So as they age more, they do get bigger and tend to be more massive, but it's also nutrient dependent. So if it's, if it's a really harsh year or you have like, like Cooey's deer in, in southern New Mexico, Arizona, where nutrients are sparse to start with, it doesn't make sense to grow trees. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's not worth the nutrients relative to what they need to do. So a lot of that can be controlled. There's also a genetic predisposition to that too. So like like deer that are farmed, they put a tremendous amount of effort into the nutrients, but also the genetics that expresses the nutrients. And that's where they get the gigantic ones that make no sense. That probably in the wild would not make sense. You know, they're too big. There's a point of where carrying around tree trunks becomes a problem. Yeah, yeah, or stuck in trees. Right. They tend to, and what, and what happens, for example, in, in the work we did with all of our radio collars and home ranges and things, and the home range is where the animal spends most of the time. Mm -hmm. And on Barry, in a lot of cases, we're, we're looking at 100 acres to up to maybe 300 acres. And if you were in the west, that deer would never survive. They may be several square miles home range. Does that make sense? Instead of a couple acres, you may be, it may be 2,400 acres, 4,000 acres. So, so that has a lot to do with it. And then again, they are, there are only kind of, white-tailed deer are more loose family arrangement where other ones like mule deer, I mean, they have family groups, kind of like horse herd harem kind of things where white-tailed deer don't do that, but they will tend to stay in areas that, that fit them. So there's a good chance there's like that. And they're like it stays until if you throw out water, do you just pump it out? Or is it about what? Typical in the wild is from five to eight years. In captivity, it's been over 20. So yeah, they can, they can hang around for a while, but five to eight years is, is very typical.
Sir. Could you touch on predator so if you're in Canada you don't have to wear a mask? Yeah, predator wise it's it's kinda mm -hmm. interesting because if you think about the way it was, so for example, we had red wolves and all kinds of things here that that had the opportunity to control the population. Anytime we crank up something, something else is trying to chase it and go up and down. Um, I think the biggest thing that has changed probably in the last 10 years has been coyotes. You know, 50, even 15, 20 years ago, you didn't see a coyote here. And I grew up with coyotes in New Mexico. I mean, they were, they were very, very common. And from a predation standpoint, fawns are their key. So we call it recruitment. That is their primary thing. Because, you know, a big coyote's 35, 40 pounds. I find it interesting. People go, oh, they're going to go attack a cow. And I'm going, <laughs> why? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How and why? And they're smart enough to go, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. Even a mature deer is probably not a good idea. I mean, there's been a couple documented cases of groups of them trying to do something with some mature deer. But even that, you know, a 35, 40 pound animal versus 100 pound, there's something wrong with that concept. And deer can hurt you. They're not, they're not fun to play with, really. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing we're seeing, and, it, and it's part of why I think we're seeing such an increase in the number of coyotes is we're giving them something else to eat mm -hmm. and grow. Bobcats, we've got a little bit associated with them. Wolves, we never really liked having, or in our case, you know, are there mountain lions? Probably a couple, but not very many, because we don't, you know, we wouldn't mind sharing a few deer, but we don't like them sharing our pets or an occasional jogger. <laughs> and so we tend to select it against those predators. Probably still about the same, maybe a little more. Um, well, they are kind of in the wild. They're just really kind of habituated to people. I would say it's still pretty much the same, and we have some 10 to 12-year-old deer. I've got a great picture. I had a call one time to come see this doe because they were concerned that she had some kind of disease or something because she was running around around people, and I go driving up, and I have my binoculars. Next thing I know, she's running right at me. <laughs> And this thing must have been, she had to be 12 to 15 years, and she only had two incisors left, and that's why her tongue was hanging out. There's nothing to keep it in there. And so she had been fed a whole lot. But she is probably one of the older deer I've seen, and she's probably about 10 to 12. But she had been helped. So they don't miss a big thing? No, I've never seen one much past the normal range. Because um, they're still relying, you know, ultimately on food resources. And so we do a pretty good job of helping them. Because, uh, and I know it drives, it drives, it grounds people absolutely crazy. It does here at Oak Hill, too, when you put stuff out and it goes, <laughs> which we did. I don't know if you remember a number of years ago at the roundabout, they used to have lots of flowers in there. And one time when the, the horticulturist had put out a bunch of pansies, and that night the deer ripped out 400. So we went out, and I said, let's go try something. So we replanted the whole thing in nylon flowers. <laughs> and you know what? They ripped every one of them out Aww. and threw them on the ground, <laughs> dumped them out in the road, got a phone call. The president was not pleased. <laughs> so we went out and picked up all the flowers we put out, but they pulled every single one of those out. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, my daughter doesn't plant them anymore. It's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. And again, it's that you know motivation relative to risk. And that's kind of with the subdivision deal, too, is think about it as, as a lot of times when we have this woods area, and we cleared out, and then all of a sudden there's 50 million deer there, and people are going, look, we infringed on their habitat. No, you didn't. You opened the habitat up, and you made the best salad bar possible. <laughs> and then you have an animal that habituates to people, and they're going, God, let's go. Doesn't get any better than this. Blue cheese dressing or no? I mean, they're in good shape. Uh, sure. Most of the time, they're, go they're going to do both. They can do both. Under serious pressure, they will become more nocturnal and hide during the day and sleep more. Um, but th they're going to do more of the on-off stuff, which actually most animals do. I think the coolest one is horses. Horses sleep an average of about four hours out of 24, and it's in 15, 20-minute spurts, and that's it. So they do stand up, they have an apparatus to lock their legs in, which kind of be handy. I wish I had it sometimes. <laughs> you know, so they won't fall over, and then they wake up, and they're ready to walk away, which is really kind of cool. But it's going to be different, and it'll change by animal and by season. So, for example, bucks, a lot of people that hunt will say, oh, they've gone nocturnal. Yeah, 
they do and they go, okay, the threat is too high, so I have to modify my behavior because me as a hunter or somebody as a hunter is a challenge and they go, we can fix that. I'll just play when it's darker because you can't. So it's not that uncommon. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Well, it's just if you think about bird seed, it's really just different pieces of grain, okay. and that's high concentrate kind of energy. Does that make sense? Much better quality than grass seed. So that's good stuff. It's not recommended. It's not illegal. It's just not recommended. The the only real potential challenge with it at this point is anytime you concentrate animals, you also increase the chance of spreading disease and causing problems and things like that. That's the only real risk of it. Um, but a lot of people are feeding and there's actually discussions, you know, about even hunting over bait and things like that and, and putting seeds and things out. So that's, it, there's a variety, but there's always arguments with that, you know, of saying feeding versus not feeding. Um, I end up feeding a lot at my house, just not intentionally, but they come over and visit the goats, you know, come visit the horses, and, and it's okay. My bird feeders, they tend to stay away from, but it doesn't, you know, that doesn't surprise me at all. It's just like a but little variety. Picking the pine straw, or are they just kind of moving it around? They're picking through that, because the pine straw basically is very high in tannins, which if you ever go try one, go chew on them, just for something to do. They're very, very bitter, yeah. and while bitter... You know, as a general rule, bitter is something that's not good for you. It's why we have to learn how to drink coffee and stuff, because naturally it's like, should be bad for you, but we like it anyway. The other thing with bitter, too, that, that if you think about it, too, there's also lots of tannins and, and acorns and things. So they can tolerate it, but they don't like it. So if you ever tried that, go eat a raw acorn, it hurts. Well, don't break your teeth, but I mean, the taste itself is just not very palatable to us. I do have a plan. If one of you are getting too active and the other one started bumping the other one, it's not that hot and it's not that hot. How does that work? Is there a way? It was that older heifer and it started noticing it. Um, and it was like she was saying it's time. Probably. Probably saying we've had enough and we're done. But they are. That's all right. They are really... They're not as nice and friendly as people think. If you ever get a chance, I mean, deer fights are fun to watch. <laughs> Does are even more fun to watch. Forget the antlers. It's a standing up boxing thing. It's really cool. I think it is. But they're not, they're not as nice and friendly and polite as people think. Just like we're talking about handling them. Yeah. Man, hanging on to a deer is not a fun experience. A th holding a 70-pound deer is a good chance of putting you in the hospital. And when you're holding it, it means wrapping your legs around the midsection and holding it like this, and you've got a chance. And it's only 70 pounds. You know, we get so spoiled when we think about a 1,000-pound horse and go, eh. But that's why wildlife is wild. It, there is a big, big difference with it, big difference. So they can be cute and cuddly or not. Bears are more competitive. Yes. Yeah. Now, they're usually not going to capture them. But yes, as a scavenger, they will. They got a chance, they certainly would, but they're, you know, most bears are going to be way too slow, way too slow. And again, stuff fights back. They don't like to be eaten. I've seen that with all kinds of species, watching a little mouse take out a snake because it didn't want to be dinner. Big difference in motivation. <laughs> Very good. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you all for coming. In. Thank you for your work with the photos. They're absolutely gorgeous.